The Mayberry Investments Limited Virtual Investor Forum has been the standard for investor education in Jamaica for decades where top financial minds provide comprehensive insight into the market and ideal investment strategies and opportunities for our clients. Celebrating 37 years of excellence in investment banking. The Mayberry Virtual Investor Forum. Investing in Jamaica. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our weekly investor series. I'm your host, Dan Theok, Senior Vice President of Investment Banking. Today, we'll be having a special investor briefing for you all. We'll be looking at Supreme Ventures Limited, and we'll be joined by Gary Parrott, Executive Chairman of SVL. Welcome, Gary. And Hi, guys. How are you? And by Christopher Berry, Executive Chairman of Mayberry Investments Limited. Welcome, Chairman. Hi, Dan. Well, if you're a fan of the content, then don't forget to subscribe. Also hit the bell to stay up to date with the channel. We upload content just like this just about every week. Don't forget to stick around to the end of the segment where we'll have our Q&A segment. Also, if you want to embark on your very first investment journey, you should take that first step with Mayberry Investments. Follow us on social media to learn more about how you can get started today. Okay, as promised, uh, first up, we're going to take a quick look at Supreme Ventures Limited. Um, and I'd like to just take a look at the financial results for the year ended December 31st, 2023. And thereafter, we'll open this up for a little bit of discussions with Gary Parrott, Executive Chairman of SVL, uh, Christopher Berry, and then we'll also take some questions, as I said, from you guys at the end of the program. Okay, so if we bring up on the presentation, the results for the year ended December 2023, we're looking at the audited financial statements here, and we can see that total gaming revenues uh, declined marginally by 2% to $49.9 billion. Direct expenses were reduced by 4% or about $1.5 billion. And the net result was that the gross profit increased by 7% to 12% billion dollars. SGNA increased by about 21% or $1.5 billion, and the net result was a 13% fall in operating profit to $3.8 billion. And I'm sure we'll be talking about the SGNA in our Q&A segment with Mr. Parrott. Um, following from that, we also saw a 15% fall in the profit before taxation to $3.27 billion. And the net profit attributable to shareholders after taxation uh, fell 21% to $2.44 billion. That's an EPS of $0.92. Cents. And at the current stock price of $23.76, that translates into a P.E. ratio of 25 times. Total assets up by 14% to $20.87 billion. So rock solid there. Uh, total liabilities up to $15.77 billion, and total equity relatively flat at $5.1 billion. In fact, uh, the net result of them having a $2.4 uh, billion profit and paying out $2.5 billion in dividends meant the retained earnings fell marginally. But it's good to see SVL having a healthy balance sheet, strong level of uh, retained earnings, and paying healthy levels of dividends, $2.5 billion or roughly 95 cents for 2023, and about the same $2.5 billion worth of dividends, $2.45 billion in dividends for 2020-22. So definitely a company that is consistent um, with the dividends, and we greatly appreciate that. Next slide. Um, well, look, let's just look at some other details. So EPS, $0.92, cents, as I said, 52-week high in the stock price of 31 52-week low of $20, market cap now at a healthy $62 billion. And these guys are cementing their position in the gaming space with revenues of $50 billion. We'll talk a little bit about why the SG&A jumped by about $1.8 billion and how that impacted the profit for the year, no doubt. Next slide shows sort of the um, revenues by segment. No changes here, really. The lion's share of the revenues coming from the lottery, about $23.6 billion, followed by sports betting at $14.4 billion, and the sale from PID codes or telephone cards um, of $12.2 billion, all sort of 
holding their own there, uh, respectively, with marginal fall, as we said, from the prior year, about 2%. Next slide shows that composition by percentage. And again, you know, the lion's share of the revenue is coming from the lottery and the sport betting, with PIN codes also sort of holding its own. And that's good to see. Next slide shows the profit by a quarter. We'll definitely be talking about this. And we can see in the last two quarters where the profits have fallen into that sort of $300, $400 million space. And we want to talk a little bit about that. We know they're expanding in Ghana, Africa. There seems to be some startup costs associated with that. Uh, we see lots of good things happening with the business, including them recently getting a license to get into remittances. So we'll be talking about that as well, too, I'm sure. Next slide, final slide for me, shows the trading of the stock over the last uh, two years. And again, we see the stock price sort of bouncing around from a low of $23 here to a high of $30. Um, currently closing at 23.76 as we said before which is a PE of 25 times and with that that pretty much closes my quick analysis of the company again going back to the first slide I just again want to emphasize um, the fact that the profits are down by about 21 percent but we're seeing healthy level of dividends and we're seeing great potential for the company for future growth in form of their expansion in Ghana Africa so We'll definitely be talking about that. So, Mr. Parrot, first one up for me, for you, sir. Two questions. Uh, give us an update on how things are going in Ghana because you're clearly in startup mode there. And then follow that up with just explaining to us a little bit about the fall off in profits, the, the jump in the SGA in particular, despite us seeing an impressive tightening on the direct expenses and the growth in the gross profit. Thank you, Dan. Um, thanks, everybody, for, for tuning in. So starting with Ghana, as you know, we, we began in August 1. Um, come the end of March, we'll be approximately nine to ten months in. Um, we, we are rolling out in keeping with our plan. So our digital channel is now fully in place. So our pick one game, one our pick four game is up and running. Um, it's robust. We haven't had any issues in terms of from... The software and development side, um, a couple of challenges we face there in Ghana is the telcos, you know, have infrequent outages. Um, unfortunately, you know, after a sustained period of about a month or two without any outages, we had a major break of an underground um, line, um, which affected several countries in Africa, but primarily Ghana. So we continue to we continue to navigate that. But most importantly, in terms of the way forward. Um, we're currently rolling out our terrestrial channel and we expect in the next three months to have in excess of 3,000 um, locations and our machines as we would we'd refer to it. Um, so we're budgeting for a profit this financial year and I believe we're on track to for Ghana to be accretive to our earnings um, going forward. And obviously as we move from 2024 into 2025, and extract that potential, we expect that profit to become uh, materially larger as time goes by. So that's on the on the Ghana side. As it pertains to the fall off in profit, um, it's all about the last quarter, the December quarter. Because if you look on, on the quarters leading up to September, we were ahead of prior year. Um, I believe we ended the September quarter somewhere around 2.1 billion. And given the prior year's overall profit of 3 billion, and usually September gives us anywhere between 900 to 1.1 billion in profits. We thought we were we were on track to beat last year. Um, well, unfortunately for us as the host, but a great thing for all of our customers and players out there, you know, a series of factors fell into place that has never ever happened before. You know, so for the month of October, all the favorites in sports betting won. And I think it was the first time since we started since this investment group came into SVL in 2017, it's the first month where we actually lost money on sports betting, and that was in October. Uh, we've never seen that before. Um, at the same time, we had two Super Lotto winners within 10 days. And um, earlier on in the year, uh, which didn't affect the last quarter, but we had a major winner of half a billion dollars. But basically, in the space of 10 days, we had two winners, one for 300 odd million, then followed up with another one for $125 million. And then, um, for those who play my games, you'll know what the FOPL is. The FOPL is, is a pick four with 999 plays, which are four nines. 
And the football played along with the mega ball at, I think, a three o'clock draw. And so put into perspective to give you an idea as to what we faced at the time. We had pick four sales of about $12 million and paid out $160 million in winners um, in that draw. And those winners took that money and went into the cash pot draw at six o'clock. And the prize liability on cash pot claim was at 120%. So, I mean, that day we had record payouts in cash to our customers. So, you know, it has been, and that was followed through with higher price liabilities on the, the cash pot side, etc. You know, but this is how the business is run. Um, and the beautiful thing is that, you know, we focus on the customer. And the customer had an amazing experience for the final quarter of 2023. Um, and as I said, even though they had that great experience, it impacted our profitability. Um, to the tune of about a billion dollars pre-tax. After tax, it would have cost us about between 700 to 750 million dollars. But again, it speaks to another strength of, of SVL that a lot of people don't appreciate. You know, our, our ability to meet these bills and pay these winnings on a timely basis. And nobody had a problem collecting their winnings. Um, and you know how this business goes. You win today, you reinvest, and we'll make some more money going forward. As we put out in the press release, what we saw in the final quarter of December, I think is, as I said, I won't say it's one off. I mean, lightning can strike twice. Um, but it's very unlikely to reoccur in, in a short space of time. And uh, without trying to give away too much, um, we're already seeing that the first quarter of 2024 is tracking what it normally tracks. You know, for obvious reasons, I can't give you the specific numbers, but you read into that as 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 you may. And, you know, as as a CEO of the organization, it is prudent for us to, to make our shareholders understand that you need to analyze the profits in a particular way so that you are not fooled into thinking the fundamental direction of the company has changed. Um, when in fact, it is not only has it not changed, it's actually getting better. You know, so I put that out there. So any investor who is fooled to sell, um, when the first quarter comes out, please don't blame me. <laughs> I've done as best as I can um, where, where that's concerned. So, you know, in a quarter that he expected about a billion dollars in profit, which would have carried us to about $3.2 billion, um, we made about 300 so we ended the year at $2.4 billion. Um, it's disappointing in the sense of the outturn of the profit, um, but it's great because SVL primarily is about its customer base, and our customers had an amazing experience, as I said, for the, for the final quarter. So we put things into perspective. We have many different platforms. Um, so came on a track, which is a horse racing. We on average make six millionaires a month. We had 68 millionaires for 2023. Um, that follows through with any bet and just bet in our sports betting side where we create millionaires there. And of course, you know, the others in terms of super lotto, lotto. I didn't even speak to the lotto. We had record winners in lotto. And during that quarter, we had about three or four lotto hits. You know, so that confluence of factors for all of those different products paying out at their maximum during that period of time impacted the profitability. But the simple reality is that it benefited our customer. And once the customer is happy, we are doing we're doing a good job. I appreciate that. And I think it's good to note that in you know over fifty billion dollars of, of gaming revenues, we're saying more than 90% is being paid out back to the customers to local ordinary Jamaicans for the most part. Correct. Excellent. That's good to know. And and additionally, uh, you guys continue to be, I noted it when reading the audited financial statements, one of the largest contributors to the government coffers. So I think in the last year alone, perhaps $10 billion, uh, if my memory serves me well, and $27 billion. Yes. It's the second year, year in yeah. a row that we've topped $10 billion. So again, despite the reduction in the top line income, um, we're still able, you know, to to generate an excess of ten billion dollars government coffers. You know, as some as somebody once said to me, you know, um, SVL is actually a government collector in disguise. You know, and you know, it's one of the things I try to explain to our regulators. You know, that the more underground games that they can carry above above ground, the government will get their fair share. Of taxes and that's what that's what SVL does. Yeah, I mean you're the success story to the equivalent of Carreras, right? So the idea that you make two and a half billion dollars profit and pay four times that to the government coffers, ten billion dollars, 
demonstrates who the largest stakeholder in SVL in fact there is. There you go. <laughs> yeah. I can't I, I can't think of a better deal that the government have. So you know, you know, we, we, we expect to be shown some love at some point in the future. I'm sure you will. Tell me a little bit about Cayman as uh, show me what's happening there in terms of love. That's the business you guys took on. Um six, well, seven well, years unfortunately ago. we don't get a lot of love there. Yes. Um you know, the the sad thing for twenty three is that uh, we lost money again. Uh, we made money after tax last year, but we lost money in 23. And um, that's a direct consequence of the stoppages that occurred during the year. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I try to explain to the stakeholders out at Caymanas, you know. I, I don't have a problem if you disagree with me, but we need to find a way in which we can speak about resolution without stopping um, the revenue path. And the irony of it is that, you know, they, they basically stopped the business. Um, I think there are about three or four race days that, you know, they withheld nominations somewhere around there. And th why it's ironic is that they're doing that because they want to increase purses. But when they stop the business, there's less revenue. And obviously, if there's less revenue, there's less purses. You know, so it, it doesn't make sense because we can't pay purses out of thin air. And, you know, we're running a business to, 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 to make a profit or at the very least to have a, a relatively small amount of, of losses if they're going to be losses. You know, so that was very disappointing. Um, I think the numbers that has come out, revenue from live racing has gone gone down. Um, you know, the bright spot, the bright spot of that Caymanos is that revenue from simulcast is up, you know, and it's one of our higher margin business. And so we, we have to find a way to, to, to look at it. But as I said, you know, we have to find a middle ground because, you know, recently, again, the regulator has, has implemented a new rule. You know, unfortunately, they didn't speak to us at all before they implemented this rule, um, which, is, which, is, which, is, which is unheard of. Um, we've just recently seen where the Bank of Jamaica has put the new rules pertaining to ATMs, et cetera. And what's instructive, you know, they're giving the marketplace nine months to understand it and get an understanding of what's going on. And, you know, the regulator in racing has just put in two new rules and it's just implemented effective immediately. You know, and, you know, so in the case of the rule um, pertaining to post time, you know, if k is, is going to is going to have to find a way to conform, it will result in less race days for live racing. You know, so here it is again. Everybody wants purses to go up. But the regulator is taking actions that indirectly leads to a reduction of purses, you know. And so what it means is that, you know, people are going to come back to us asking for increased purses when really and surely they, they need to turn to the regulator who was putting in this rule to, you know, to subsidize the purses. Maybe that's a solution that that needs to that needs to happen. You know, but the reality is that we need some amount of harmony and understanding. Um, you know, to, to move that product forward. The team led by Solomon continues to do a great job. But, you know, it's it's difficult when you're trying to eke out revenues and you have stakeholders that's not fully understanding what a racetrack requires and having to deal, um, you know, with, with these things. But like everything else, you know, we have invested. Um, we're supposed to invest $500 million. We've invested $4 billion. Um, and at this point in time, we just need to harvest, you know, until I think all the stakeholders can come together and understand what is required to move this business forward, um, we will continue to struggle somewhat there. But I'm optimistic, um, Dan, that ultimately sense, common sense and sense will prevail and people start to understand that, you know, we are not hostile to the industry. You can't be hostile to an industry and invest $4 billion, Dan, you know. So we need more people at the table. Um, inclusive of the government. And I think once we can do that, uh, we'll expect to see in the future uh, much more profits um, going forward. Yeah, I look forward to it. I made my one visit last year, and as far as I'm concerned, it's super fantastic. Tell me a little bit about it, the Mute Mile. I, I went and yeah. saw a different side, I guess, of Cayman as it was really well, pumping Padre. You know, really and, and that's it. the irony of it, Dan, which is what we're trying to explain to our local stakeholders, right? We're sitting on a gold mine that, can, we can only extract the gold if all the stakeholders um, stand together. You know, um, the team at, at Cayman single-handedly have brought this product internationally. We've been rewarded with Fox and Naira. You know, choosing Jamaica to be a place 
to, to showcase to the rest of the United States. And, you know, so if people questioned where we wanted to go with this business, I mean, how much more do we need to do, you know? And so we put, we showcased Jamaica and the best of Jamaican horse racing on that day, you know? But, I mean, what do you do when you have a leader um, of one of the key stakeholders in you know, Howard Hamilton who says that the, the Mote Mile is, is a failure? You know, something that brings the Naira, Fox Sports, all this type of men, I mean... You know, as as I said to to Howard, I mean, probably he needs to understand the definition of what success is. But this is what we face, you know. And deep down, I know Howard believes it's a success. But if he if he has to say something negative, probably that's when people focus on him. But let's see. Good deal. I will definitely have a word with Uncle Howard because I totally disagree with you on that one, Howard. Uh, Mr. Barry, you've been quiet. Uh, I'm sure you must have a question or two for Mr. Parrott, who you've put in charge or you had some influence on helping him get in charge of SVL. Yes, well, um, I, I, I don't really have any questions. I think... Um, my question would have been around the the fall and the profits. I think Gary did a, a, a very good job of explaining what happened. And um, based on what he said, uh, it, it seems like the train is moving forward and there will be good fruits on it in the future. So I'm, I'm good. How are you feeling about Africa, Mr. Barry? You've actually made a trip or two uh, to Ghana yourself. How are you feeling about the expansion in uh, Ghana? And what would you say to those of us who are out there thinking, hey, it's been six months, what's taking so long? So breaking into new markets is always difficult. And I think we had a, a case study in that in Jamaica. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's not easy for new players to break into a new market. I think in Ghana, we are doing well when you compare our numbers to the other digital channels. And um, we're, we're definitely a new player there. Uh, we have local partners who are helping us to break into the market. And um, I haven't given up on Ghana. I'm still very confident and I'm very hopeful. But one thing I can tell you is that um, once we crack that code over there, uh, it, it will be spectacular. The great thing about it is that the investment in Ghana is not sufficient to really impact the company in any major way even if it goes to zero. So um, it's a good bet for us. A um, lot of upside with a little downside. We just have to get everything to work together and, and it will be good. Okay, I appreciate that. So Gary, speaking of new markets, uh, uh, remittances, I see where you guys have recently been approved by the BOJ, received a license. Uh, it looks like you're going into the remittance business. Tell me a little bit about that. How does that fit into the group? Um, Dan, it's it's not just remittance. It's I mean the, the, the bigger vision, you know, remember when I the first time I think I, I came on this program for SVL, we spoke about S how we saw SVL at the time, which you know is a transaction platform with a lottery business on that platform. It's a technology and company so that does a lot of things, yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. We're just putting other businesses on that transaction platform. So, you know, a lot of people don't realize, but SVL is the largest seller of phone credit in the country. So in addition to our lottery that we sell on the terminals, we also sell um, phone credit um, at the right price to, to, to the majority of people in, in, the, in the country. So, you know, that's another level of transaction that's on the platform. We're into bill payments now in a limited way, we're looking to expand that. Um, so what has recently gotten a lot of excitement is the remittance business. Um, you know, we also have microfinance on it. But, you know, there are processes. I mean, anything where you're regulated by the Bank of Jamaica, they, the BOJ makes sure that they do their proper due diligence and they, for a better, better word, they move in baby steps to ensure that, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you comply. 
So based on what has happened, we got the we got the approval somewhere around November, December. Um, we have to go through a transition, a conditional phase, um, where we currently have six locations. Um, so I think that's where they get to test our structure, etc., our processes or procedure. So we're currently we're currently doing business. We're ahead of the budget that we had put together. Um, we've just done a review. We're waiting on the results of that. Uh, we expect to to pass that with flying colors. And basically, the end of the conditional period is somewhere around the end of April and May. Uh, once we get that additional approval from the Bank of Jamaica, then we'll have a full license. And at which point, we can roll out massively across the country. So we would we would increase significantly from six locations to at least 300 to 500 locations across the island. Um, we expect to, to get about 10% of the market within the next three years. Um, I mean, that's our initial goal. We think it's complementary to the different locations we have um, in, in, in lottery. And then obviously on the remittance side, what it does for us, a lot of our lottery locations then issue a lot of get receive a lot of cash from the sale of cash bar. Um, and then so they have to lodge those monies and you know that has different risks, people trying to rob them, etc. So when we put remittances into the key retailer locations, they can use the cash that they receive from the sale of cash bar and our lottery products and pay it out on the remittance side. You know, so what it does. It materially reduces the amount of cash in a location, which will reduce the amount of times you have to go to the bank. And, you know, so that's also paramount in my mind, the safety and security of, of our retailers. So we're very excited about the, the remittance side of things. I mean, obviously, it's going to give us some revenue. We'll earn foreign exchange. We'll earn the spread on the foreign exchange and also the fee. But ultimately, what the overall vision is, Dan, we have what is called the Supreme Life Platform. And that platform, we as, as I indicated, we're going to put more and more businesses on that platform. So we have a digital channel right now where people can come and bet on our different lottery games. We're getting to a point, the, the future we see is that when you come to um, SVL, you'll be able to not only play our games, but partake in all of these other services where for a better word, it becomes like a one-stop shop, you know? So we'll continually to look at other businesses. If we think the margins are big enough, then we'll go in there in a proprietary way. But even if the margin is not big enough, we can then bring on third parties onto, onto our platform. You know, so we we see the digital side of the business as being key. And right now, I think we're morphing from a transaction company with businesses on it, ultimately into a tech company because we're constantly developing tech to, 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 to be able to provide these services in as short a time and in a convenient way, and most importantly, in a cost-effective way um, to our customers. So you have island-wide reach throughout how many terminals, Gary? I know it's well north of 1,200. So in terms of terminals across all our businesses, we have approximately 2,100 points of sale um, in terms of terminals, right. um, you know, which, which we can expand. And that's across our various businesses. So that's horse racing, sports betting, uh, microfinance, uh, primarily lottery. You know, so we have a nice footprint across the island. And you're handling a substantial amount of cash, uh, over five billion dollars per month, by my math. You, you need not right. run it. But <laughs> excellent, good deal. So tell me a little bit now about. So I understand the remittance business, and I can tell you whenever I look at the remittance business. For any listed company, it's usually a very profitable segment, folks. Um, highly profitable. I mean, if you look at the Grace Kennedy Group, for instance, it's, it's the most profitable um, segment in terms of margins and has great potential for growth. So I, mm -hmm. I certainly like the space. It makes a lot of sense. But tell us a little bit about the microfinance space now. We see you guys making two moves uh, in recent uh, years, as, as many years, um, mm -hmm. into the microfinance right. space uh, in the form of Michaela Financials and uh, Dollar Financial Services Limited. So tell us a little bit about why microfinance and synergies and why that's also a good fit for what you guys do. So again, you know, we speak about a, the Supreme Life. You know, people, people come to the platform for a variety of different reasons. Um, so we have a lot of retailers who not only retail or lottery products, but you know, they'll be they have wholesales, 
they have other small businesses that they do stuff with. And so what has happened is we actually brought on a fintech solution in microfinance called Evolve that has been primarily rolled out within my retailer structure um, in SVL. Um, as a consequence of that or a follow through on that, we bought into Michaela, you know, to get countrywide exposure to, to microfinance. Um, in 2023, we initially, we were majority shareholders. We went further and bought all the minorities and we now own Michaela 100%. So we have 100% of Michaela, we have 100% of Evolve, but if for a better, Evolve is electronic or digital, uh, Michaela is terrestrial, you know, so we have those two channels. Um, they're growing pretty nicely. They're both profitable. And what that does now is complement ourselves because we have the opportunity to invest in what I believe is the number one microfinance company in the space, which was Dollar. And so when that opportunity was presented to SVL, SVL definitely took, took, took advantage of that. And uh, we've made that investment. That investment has gone pretty well, certainly for 23. And starting in 24, it continues to, it continues to do well. So we're getting capital appreciation from, 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 that, from that investment, as well as dividend income from that investment. You know, so I think we have a nice exposure to the microfinance side of the business. And as SVL becomes more mainstream in the minds of the customer, in other words, the customer just doesn't see us as um, lottery and starts to understand all of these other things. Um, you know, we expect significant growth um, in all those other areas. So for example, once we get in the case of remittance up to our, our, our threshold of three, 400 locations, which maybe by this the third quarter of September, you know, that's will start to drive profit. Um, or bill payment will, will be on the back of that. That starts to drive profit as well. Uh, Michaela and FinTech are, and Evolve are now up to are mature. We expect nice profits coming out of that. So I'm very excited about 2024 because for 23 and before, we had to be carrying these companies as the investments were being made. So as you can imagine, Whilst we were waiting the, the, the approvals for permittance and BOJ, you know, you had to be carrying salaries. You, you know, so 2023 was a year of investment. You know, so we invested in, in tech for bill payment, um, tech for microfinance, um, tech for Ghana. And so we we're carrying all of those costs and you did not have the revenue maturing on the other side. We expect for 2020, 2024, that we will see, no pun intended, the evolving of that of, the, of that revenues. And I expect 2024 to be a very good year for SVL. I can't wait to see the first quarter results come out. Same question kind of for you, Chairman Barry. This is not your first or second or even your third rodeo with respect to microfinance businesses. Uh, we see um, SVL taking a stake in dollar financials, but we also observed MJE. Uh, following suit as well too. Uh, tell me what excites you about the microfinance space and perhaps dollar financials as well too. Yes, yeah, so as you will recall, way back in the day before it was popular, uh, we we had a child by the name of Access, and um, when we got in Access, they were making less than ten million dollars a year. And when we left them, they're making about 300 million. Um, we feel that that access should have and could have been much bigger, but you know the team just couldn't find a way to stay together. We had to split up, and um, we have been striking different partnerships and going exploring different ways of, of trying to create something special in microfinance. We see it as a very big opportunity in Jamaica. It's not a market which is really being addressed by the traditional financial sector. And uh, based on what we see, we don't expect them to be able to deal with these type of customers anytime soon. Um, 
not in this Jamaica that we are living in. As time passes, you know, I think the traditional financial sector um, will catch up in that area, but there's going to be some real big companies born and growing out of that microfinance business. And I think that's why you see BOJ getting involved because they realize that this thing really has legs and they need to get involved before it gets too big. So I think it's 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 a huge opportunity. Um, we just have to find a way to bring it all together. Good deal. Yep, I think I agree. So we see the regulation coming. We expect there to be a lot more consolidation in the space. And we see, I'm going to call them the new kid on the block, a company that was around for seven, eight years listing um, 15 months ago in the form of dollar financials and demonstrating a culture and a capability to grow that business substantially. Mm -hmm. And similarly, we saw their December 2023 results coming out uh, this week and and profits up uh, you know over fifty percent over four hundred million dollars loan books grown very nicely over fifty percent and so this business really seems poised for great growth growing their loan book from four hundred million dollars three years ago to now over two point five billion dollars and so I I too look forward with great excitement to see how Dollar Financials continues to grow great team over there. A great leadership and partnership uh, between Mayberry, Estrell, uh, and this team. And so I think that company really is poised for significant growth. And I think it's a great investment made by Estrell and MJE together. Um, so it's great to see that business doing well. And we look forward to further future updates. Uh, so Mr. Parrott, um, Estrell, I mean, we see you guys also uh, on the balance sheet side taking on some additional loans uh, to grow the business a little bit. I think you grew your loan book by about $3 billion, grew your total asset base to $20 billion, made some great investments and so on. Uh, I mean, what really is the future growth capabilities of SVL even within the region, even within the country? I mean, how, how much further can this business really grow? Um, you know, Dan, I've been thinking of different words to answer this question um, because, you know, I'm thinking of words like limitless, um, significant. And, you know, uh, so I put it in perspective, you know, the Ghanaian experience has created significant value already for us. Um, so, you know, we, we now have technology where we can sell a lottery ticket from a cell phone, not just a smartphone, but a dumb phone. Mm. Um, and that's that's significant. I mean, we, we can't roll that technology out as yet in, in Jamaica because we don't we don't we don't yet have a wallet, right? Um, so there are certain digital breakthroughs that we have made in Ghana, which we're just waiting for the parameters to put it to be put in place um, for Jamaica. Um, to be able to roll those out. Those, things like that could increase our efficiency in Jamaica um, in terms of our profitability 30 to 50 percent, you know, if we if, if we implement um, those kind of things. Remember, you know, the size of our lottery business is a little bit under 500 million US, right? So every one percent that we can save is going to drive 5 million US to the bottom, mm -hmm. right? Um, so there may, there's a lot of different ways to save different one percents with, with those new efficiencies. Um, two, Ghana, Ghana is 30 million people. You know, Jamaica is three. So if we're making 20 million US with three million people, a population of three million people, you know, what does that profit looks like mm -hmm. with a population ten times larger? Um, it'll take time. I don't think it'll take as much as 20 years. Um, you know, but. If, if, if we're able to get half of that in five years' time, you know, that's 50, 60 million US dollars. That's three, four times where the business is right now. That's just one African country. Um, you know, they are, they are, we, we now have significant opportunity because people across the world now know that we have our proprietary software. Uh, we can compete with the best. And so that puts us in a position to go into several jurisdictions. So in the case of Ghana, we have to spend our own capital, but there's an opportunity to just charge a fee and go into different markets. And we have demonstrated by get going into Ghana and getting a license 
So to put it in perspective, SVL is the first third party lottery operator that has gotten a provisional license in Ghana. Most other people who operate in Ghana operate the existing 5 in 90 lottery as a part as a corollary of, of that of that lottery. So we have come in with new lottery products and we're the first to to to, to have done so. So it says a lot. Um, there are several other opportunities. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if in another year or two, you know, we might penetrate another 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 country. And this is in the perspective of getting a lottery license is very difficult, yeah. But we since we have come to to Supreme Ventures, we have gotten a license in in Ghana. We now have one in Ghana, and we beam to South Africa. So there are a lot of jurisdictions out there. Um, you know, and I would say, I mean, if we get two or three more jurisdictions, you're looking at doubling, increasing by a factor of 10 times over five, 10 years, the profits of the company. That's just in a lottery line. When you start to think about uh, value added stuff like remittance and other tr- potential businesses that, that we can get into, it's huge. What, we have, what we're doing in horse racing, we have other horse racing jurisdictions that want to give us contracts to operate their racetracks because of how they see what we do in Jamaica. And that's million dollar US contracts, you know? So, you know, I can talk for the rest of the day about several of the opportunities that we have from a Supreme Ventures perspective, you know? So the, the yeah. So the, the reality, the reality is that when I speak about limitless, when I speak about significant, um, when I speak about significant things to do, I'm not. I'm. I'm literally not joking, you know. And so, what we want to do for 24, which we want to demonstrate to the market in 24, is to reap return on the investments that we have made in 22 and 23, right? Um, we have invested significant amounts in not just our proprietary software, but other digital solutions, and we feel 24 is the year that we need to show and reap from those investments so we can get back um, some cash. Um, you would have seen in the latter part of 23, we borrowed some additional money. That was help, that was to help primarily with the expansion in, in Ghana, but also some of the other stuff we're doing digitally. So, you know, we're excited because we've started to pay back down other loans. Um, but you will see based on our cash metrics that our current ratio for the end of 23 is materially above the current ratio for 22 and we expect to 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 continue that increase you know so the beautiful thing about svl is that you know we we realize our accounting profit in cash within seven days after the end of the month you know which is why our dividend is so high at 90 percent right um but notwithstanding paying out 90 percent dividend we still generate in excess of one and a half billion dollars in free cash you know, so we feel with that amount of cash, we can continue um, the expansion efforts. And we think as we continue to generate the profits for this year, that free cash flow will, will, will start to increase materially. Okay, excellent. I appreciate that. Okay, so folks, I haven't been ignoring you. We, we will get into some Q&As. Um, I'm going to give Chairman the opportunity if he has any other question he wants to ask, Gary. That's going to Q&A. Um, but let's do the Q&A first because I've seen a few questions coming in um, already. Okay, so first one comes in from Devon who's asking, uh, Gary, what exactly is Supreme Ventures University and what is the value and the tenure of the contract for the learning management system? Um, so the Supreme Ventures University is a key aspect of our vision. Um, I think I've told this story before. I mean, personally, coming up in the corporate sector in Jamaica, um, it was always interesting to see expatriates coming to Jamaica and get all these benefits because they've been moving from their country of origin or residence to, to Jamaica. Um, since SBL has taken on the opportunity to expand into other regions, it allows us the opportunity to create our own culture. And gaming, you don't go to university and get a degree in gaming. You know, you get accounting, marketing, legal, you know. So a Supreme Ventures University creates a scenario for us to A, improve on our culture, but B, 
train our customer, our employees in a way that we would want to grow them for different opportunities within the company, right? So it, it's, it's our way of creating a deeper bench, you know? So whilst you have senior leaders, as you expand into new markets, you're going to need additional people. And so instead of trying to recruit stars from other gaming companies that are pretty expensive, we will use a university to groom our own stars and create our own stars. And over the long term, it will keep or certainly our salary costs and our salary structure um, relatively lower, but at the same time, reward um, brilliant and talented um, individuals within the company. Got it. I appreciate that. Um, Cliff Robinson asks, what percentage ownership of the Game Park Limited is being targeted for the Ghanaian acquisition? I do understand the question, but if I was to interpret it, yeah. Game Park is owned 100% by our Ghanaian partner. So SVL has no percentage ownership in Game Park. Um, what SVL, SVL has a company called IBET Ghana that provides technical marketing and other services to Game Park. And that's how we earn our revenue. We charge for the software um, in terms of the proprietary lottery software and other things um, that will ensure the, the, the proper running of our lottery business there. So if you understand the structure we have in Jamaica, um, SVL's proprietary or technical services partner in Jamaica is the Fortune 500 company, IGT. Um, so IGT provides, runs our lottery on their proprietary system and we pay them a fee. We are the IGT to Game Park in Ghana. Good deal. And they'll pay you a fee as well. So JT, hopefully that and answers your question about what... And, and, to give you, and to give you some context, huh? um, my, the profit for last year would have been about $2.4 billion. Yeah. Uh, the payment to IGT is approximately $13 million US. Very so good. that's the kind of money the technical yes. services partner will earn relative to what the lottery licensee so earns. They can make they can be more profitable than the licensee. So JT hopefully yes. that answers your question about what type of acquisition are you seeking in Ghana. I think uh Gary explained that we're gonna be the technology partner to the operators of the lottery in Ghana, their exclusive partner and earn our fees accor accordingly. Philip Burgess asks, is the government looking to designate Caymanas as an entertainment zone? I don't know what the government plans are with that, but what I can tell him is that we see Caymanas as, as an entertainment zone. And, you know, if we get our way in terms of what our plans are for Caymanas, um, Caymanas will become the number one entertainment zone in the country. Good deal. I think I think they've just approved a, another location in Port Moody, eh, Gary. Yes, they they approved Jam World, right? Um, where they think they put aside some funds to turn it into a 24, 24 hour, seven days a week for um, entertainment facility. Um, but Cayman has, has the ability to to materially be better than that. I mean, and you will see it roll itself out in a in a limited way. We have some opportunities that uh, will be brought to market pretty shortly. Got it. Philip again asks, do you plan to go into sport betting in Ghana? The, the opportunity is there. Sports betting in, in, in Africa as a continent is crazy. Mm. It's, 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 it's next level. Um, and it's, it's pretty competitive, but there are opportunities there. But like with everything else in life, and certainly with the ethos that we have, um, especially with Maber as a partner, Slow and steady wins the race, and we want to crack the code in Ghana in lottery before we start to expand in different areas. Um, because once we crack the code in lottery, that will drive a certain amount of cash flow, and which will allow us to to move into not just sports betting. There's there there are materially other opportunities, not just in Ghana but in several other African countries. Got it. Okay, some interesting questions coming on coming in here. This one looks like it's better suited for Oli Mo, but I'm gonna ask you. Oli O'Neill Johnson asks, is SVL in the running to grab the Premier League rights from C Sport? Uh no, Ali is a, a good friend of ours, but um whilst we're going to we're whilst we're going into entertainment 
in a much deeper way for 2024, um, we have we have not yet moved over to to um, digital media or you know television on that side. We're, we're not there as yet. Um, we have a very exciting venture that we are going to release to the public probably in another month. I alluded to it about a month or so ago, um, but we have just struck a deal and um, we're looking to democratize a particular industry. And it's 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 a natural extension of of what SVL is and it's the other SVL subsidiaries. And you know, O'Neill, you might you might be interested in the opportunity that we put out there. So have some have some cash ready. Uh, Tevin asks, are there any plans in the works for Anybet? Yeah, um, Anybet is doing well. As you know, we have two sports betting um brands. One is Just Bet, one is Anybet. The Just Bet brand, you know, focuses on transactional um type betting. So you anywhere you see at any bet, you can anywhere you see at just bet, you can walk up, place a bet and go about your business. Um the Anybet brand is more of a relationship um mm. brand where people people open the door at eight o'clock and don't leave until eleven. You know, so the the sports betting market is is very interesting. You have the transactional people and you have the relationship people. And so that's why we have those two brands. Um, the CEO and I, had, I actually had a conversation two weeks ago, Denmark, um, and we're looking to materially expand our locations um, because we see demand for that relationship type betting um, going forward. I appreciate that. And uh, Philip Burgess is saying that sounds mean, eventish, like Gary. So wait, wait, Philip, you soon hear more. <laughs> but we, yeah. we are in the entertainment business, by the way, Philip. So, so please bear that in mind. Uh, well, remember, SVL owns 10% of main events. So, you know, strategically we're aligned. And so we just need to, you know, we, we have sat on a lot of opportunities for the last three years. And as I said, in the next month or so, we are going to put one of those opportunities out there for a limited amount of the public to participate. Um, and we we have a structure, Dan, that, you know, once they put it out there, certainly if you don't get on board for this first event, um, we'll make that available for the different events that we're doing. So we're democratizing it and we're trying, we've found a way, we believe, to bring the public that is interested in getting exposure to the event space to come on board in a transparent way. Um, and as I said, I, I won't say any more until we, 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 we do that release, hopefully within the next month. Okay, sounds <laughs> sounds brilliant. Two more, uh, I see the questions coming in, uh, like the Fast and the Furious. Will RIA money transfers be available at all retail locations? Um, it, it will not necessarily be at all. So we're starting with Rhea. Rhea is our, our main partner in the remittance side of business. Mm -hmm. um, but once we get our full license from Bank of Jamaica, the space is open for us to even have our own proprietary uh, remittance remittance provider, which, as you know, probably would be in the mix, Dan. Not, not saying anything about that yeah. as yet. Yeah, yeah. But we also have the opportunity to offer other uh, remittance opportunities on the platform. So, you know, with a distribution network, you want to find the most optimum distribution network. And so it's very, it's it's not likely that my existing 2,100 locations will be the ideal 2,100 locations for remittance. I expect to use quite a bit of our existing um, retail locations, but it I, I also expect to take on non-SVL lottery locations as well because we're trying to find the best distribution. Uh, but I hasten to add that whilst we will have a terrestrial channel for distribution for remittance, our ultimate channel is going to be digital because the future is digital. And so we'd also be building our own proprietary digital solution and it will be a part of the SLP platform where you'll be able to access your remittance, your remittance proceeds in the same space as potentially betting on lottery or back paying bills, et cetera. You'll have, as I said, you'll have a unique one-stop shop. 
Great, so a digital wallet is definitely to come. And I apologize, guys, we ran out of time, so I can't take any more questions, but I will take this last comment from Tevon, and I'm going to read it verbatim. SVL is one of the players for years to come. Don't watch that $1 billion payout. It's a good thing. More people will play SVL games in the hope of winning, which will lead to more money into the company. <laughs> but, Amen. Well said. But that I can take two more questions if you want. Okay. I mean, we, we, we won't kill people. Okay, I agree. Um, so um, folks are saying they're looking for an APO. Folks are saying they're looking for a rights issue from MEEG. Devin asks, Gary, uh, did Gary say how much the contract was for the learning management system? So I'm just curious to know what was the contract for the learning management no, system. No, um, I, I didn't speak to the, the, the size of the contract. And reason being, uh, we're constantly learning. Huh? And so we, we, have partnered, we have partnered with Edufocal and we started out at a particular level. You know, my expectation is the feedback from my employees will determine how much deeper um, we would go and, you know, once they understand the platform and they're comfortable with it, then the expectation is that we would expect to make that contract much bigger. Um, it's currently not material in terms of the things I look at, to be very honest with you. Um, but going forward, you know, what we like about the Edifocal partnership is that, you know, once they understand our business a bit better, we can walk with them into places like Ghana, Guyana, etc. Because it can be, if we find a way to train our retailers on that Edifocal platform, um, it'll, it'll not only drive revenue for Edifocal, but ultimately drive revenues for, for SVL. And so that's what I, I primarily look forward to. Okay, makes sense to me. And that's it for the questions, but I will allow Chairman Barry a final comment or a question. Chairman Barry? Yes, Gary. So my question is, um, what do you estimate the size of the underground gaming market to be? One, two, who can deliver this revenue to the government? Who can bring it into the formal sector? And what kind of taxes the government could earn off this sector if it's captured in the in in the net. Yeah. Um, so Chris, I'll answer your question two ways. So in terms of the underground lottery market, I think the underground no, lottery no, market. No, Gary. Not no, just I'm, I'm coming. I'm going to answer. It. Give oh, me a chance, please. Oh, sorry. Give me, give me a chance. Um, I'm being pedantic for a reason. Um, the underground lottery market, I estimate to be about 20% of the above ground market. And as I said, the, the, lottery, the lottery products that we have is about half a billion US dollars. So you're talking 100, billion, 100 million US, which is about what, 15 billion. Um, so we pay effectively 65 to 70%. Um, of, of um, revenue, give or take. Um, so, you know, you're talking about, you know, we pay the government 10 billion Jamaican across all the different tax 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 levels inside the company on half a billion. So divided by five, the government can earn another two and a half, three billion dollars just from the luxury sector. Um, the box sector, and this is rather very embarrassing, but it's a fact. The betting, gaming, and lottery does not know the size of the box sector simply because they do not know how to quantify the box sector. So as we speak, the only box gaming boxes that the BGLC has a record of, I believe, is 200 or 300 SVL boxes that we report on a GPT, which is our gross profit tax basis yeah um i estimate that the gaming box business is larger than the lottery business and as i said to you before the premier regulator does not know effectively the size of that market even though they have gotten approval for what is called a gmis a gaming management information system that is not yet in place. And, you know, it's unfortunate because 
if they ask SVL, SVL can provide the necessary software requisite to allow the, the regulator to be able to track the revenues and payouts for these boxes. And so answer Chris's last question, if we assume that the box business is bigger than the lottery business, let us say it's the same size of the lottery business, that is 500 million US dollars, um, then that answer is clear. That's $10 billion that the government potentially could be losing, depending on, the, depending on the fees that they put in place. But as I said, you actually have boxes out there that the BJLC doesn't even know exist, right? Um, so well, hold, know, a, hold a second here, GP. It, it can't be as much as 10 billion because they, they, the payout on the box business is higher, so it would be lower. Well, it depends, it depends. So, remember, Chris, I made the assumption that the box business is the same size as lottery. I believe it is bigger. So, if it's bigger, and I'm assuming it's the same size, you know, I mean, if it's not 10, it's five, whatever it is, it's it's it's, it's material. You know, and so in 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 the some of the pills on the boxes are at a pretty high level, but there are some people who do not have that same level of pills, Chris. Um, you know, so the reality is that these boxes, I think they pay, if memory serves me correct, five thousand or so. I don't remember the exact number. Um, interestingly, the last person who tried to increase the fees. On, on the boxing business was our chairman of the BJC called Gary Peart. Um, and, you know, it wasn't able to go through. But that is languishing there. It doesn't take a lot for the existing people at the BJC to revive that um, because they have more, they should have more information about that industry than I had as my time as chairman of the BJLC. But it is a gaping hole right now in the industry. And it's, you know, if Minister Clark was interested in, in getting some additional revenue in an easy way, that can be done in six months or less. But hey, probably, you know, they, they don't need that money and they want the underground to continue moving. Let's see. Them don't want to tax the poor man, but the gaming business. Uh, no, it's not. Business. It's not the poor man. No, man so the, what the, happened? The box just to explain that key point, though. Dan. Yeah. Let me explain that point. Yeah. Even though these boxes are in bars, yes. You know, most of the boxes belong to about four or five main players. So, for example, SVL through one of its subsidiaries owns approximately three thousand boxes. You have other players with five and eight thousand boxes out there, so they put it into bars, and they do a revenue share. Yeah. So on the face of it, you might think the bar owner has the boxes, but it's these four or five players that are earning from these boxes. You know, so you have players that are cl that are clearing in excess of a billion dollars a year in revenue as a one person. You know, not regulated, um, and we don't know if they're paying taxes. Well, they're, they're, they're paying a fee just to put the box in place, you know. I mean, and if they're paying taxes, great. But the reality is that the government um, could be getting more, you know, because SVL pays an effective tax rate of 65%, mm -hmm. right? So if you're earning in the gaming sector, how fair is it that I have a competitor that if he's paying taxes, he's, he's paying corporate tax at 20, individual tax at 25%, and I'm paying 65%. It, it's not reasonable, eh? Yeah, yeah. But again, the, the, the point is that it is a gaping hole, you know, and there's no excuse um, for, for the regulator not making more material steps to close that hole. Understood. I appreciate that. I didn't appreciate the magnitude of it and the potential impact of the yeah. government coffers. Which every is, quarter, which is every quarter, the BJLC puts out or is supposed to put out a market share um, data report. Um, it comes out, and it, it usually should come out within a month. That I think now they're up to about 60 to 90 days after the end of the quarter. But if you read that report, you can go to their website right now, bjlc.org. And you can see the historical report. I think they have, I think December is now out, if memory serves me correct. Now, when you go through that, that report, it shows you total lottery. It shows you the total horse racing. It shows you total sports betting. And then it has, when you go to the box section, you have a small amount. When you read the commentary, 
It is from one of our subsidiary companies called Ice Jamaica. Um, and it's just 200 machines. So I have, SVL has another entity with 3,000 machines and that information is not recorded at the PGSC. Yeah, that's amazing. I literally have a friend who tried to open up uh, one of these locations and it took him six months to get approved by all of the regulators. So to imagine that they're not using that information to then collect revenue well, from the government is, is And you might find some people get approved much faster, but we don't know why that occurs. Yeah. But the key point is this. I mean, it's material revenue. And I'm just guessing, you know, I don't have fundamental facts. I just have intuition. Um, but I can tell you, it is billions and multiples of billions of dollars that's, that's flowing through that, you know, neither the regulator nor the government um, has a handle on. Um, and as I said, it doesn't take much for them to, 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 to benefit from it. Well, I hope the folks are listening to us. That's some low-hanging fruit for you there. Uh, we'd appreciate if you went after that to help regularize the sector to level the playing field. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Parrott, Mr. Berry, for your invaluable insights. Um, that's it for today's discussions. I'd like to thank our viewers, as usual, for tuning in. Your support is always appreciated. And again, you know, big thanks to... Gary Parrott, Executive Chairman of SVL, for coming on the program. We're going to have you back in 45 days. I look forward to seeing that first quarter results for sure. Folks, if you're curious about the... Update, no, you'll get it before the end of April. Before the... Oh, I like the sound of that. So we'll have you back in 30 days. I'm going to hold you to that, sir. Um, yep. Folks, if you're curious about our updates on our virtual investor forum, then find us on social media. We share our live stream dates and our upcoming guests on our official social media pages. So give us a follow to learn more about all things form related. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Mayberry Investments Limited, and click the bell to receive all our notifications. And remember, wise investors, slow and steady wins the race. Keep safe, everyone. Goodbye. The Mayberry Investments Limited Virtual Investor Forum has been the standard for investor education in Jamaica for decades, where top financial minds provide comprehensive insight into the market and ideal investment strategies and opportunities for our clients. Celebrating 37 years of excellence in investment banking. The Mayberry Virtual Investor Forum. Investing in Jamaica.